Um, so uh, we're kicking off this afternoon um, with the panel Horror Stands for Comfort, Rethinking Content Warnings in the Horror Focus Classroom. And um, chairing the panel for us this afternoon is Craig Mann. Craig? Hello. Hello. Um, and Craig's going to introduce our speakers and get things going for us. So thanks, Craig, and we'll see you soon. Cheers. So welcome to this roundtable discussion, which I think is going to bring together a lot of the kind of discussions and debates that we've been having already uh, this morning and into this afternoon. Um, I'm uh, I'm the chair for this, but I'm really kind of just a caretaker. <laughs> I'm going to introduce the speakers. They're going to handle their own Q&A at the end, and I'll just kind of pop up to close things out when we finish. So we've got three great speakers who are taking part in this roundtable discussion. <clears throat> I'm just going to introduce them and then I will hand over to them uh, to, to get going. So Ashley R. Smith is an advanced doctoral candidate at Northwestern University, whose work focuses on the poignant and often uncomfortable intersections between horror cinema, critical race theory and cultural studies. Her dissertation examines the emergence of whiteness as a destabilized and othered identity in post 1960s American horror cinema and the political and cultural changes that occurred alongside this representational shift. She teaches courses on film history, horror and diversity and inclusion at DePaul University and the School of the Art Institute in Chicago. She also currently serves as a co-chair for the Horror Studies Scholarly uh, Interest Group in the Society for Cinema and Media Studies. Her most recent publication, Dropping the Mask of Sanity, How Mindhunter Deconstructs the Profiling Procedural, is out now in the edited collection Serial Killers in Contemporary Television from Routledge. We've also got Nikita Hamar Patterson, uh, who is an Icelandic American doctoral student in English at the University of Iceland. Her background includes a BFA in film and video at the University of the Arts Philadelphia and an MA in literature, culture and media from the University of Iceland. Her research focuses on the politics of taste, the dynamics between high and low art, extreme cinema and the work of Gaspar Noé. Nikita teaches in both English and film studies at the University of Iceland, including independently developed courses and units on Hollywood, auteurism, adaptation and extreme cinema. Other interests include film production, performance studies, cult film and the performance of audiences. And Valeria Viegas Lindvall is a senior lecturer in film at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden and specialises in Latin American horror film with a feminist and decolonial focus. She is also reviews editor for MAI, Feminism and Visual Culture, and on the advisory board of MAI Imprint at Punk uh, Punkton Books. Her doctoral dissertation, Wicked Women and Witches, Subversive Readings of the Female Monster in Mexican and Argentinian Horror Film, takes to task the figures of La Laronia and the Bruja as monstrous bastions of resistance in visual culture. She has collaborated in several publications, most prominently as a co-editor, writer and translator at Rolling Stone Mexico, as well as Women Make Horror, Filmmaking, Feminism and Genre, and The Body on Screen in the Digital Age, Essays on Voyeurism, Violence and Power. So, uh, Ashley, Nikita and Valeria, over to you. Um, and you're going to handle your own Q&A. So I will just reappear at the end. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to this. Over to you. We'll see you later. Thanks so much. So uh, just Thanks. a quick disclaimer, I am in Iceland and today is the 13th day of Christmas, which has a lot of its own quirky traditions involving like saying goodbye to Christmas, the moving in and out of the house um, of the elves. But more modern times brings in the the concept of hurrying up and uh, blowing up your New Year's Eve fireworks on the last day you are legally allowed to. So if you see any flashes of light or hear any explosions, we're fine. Everything's fine. So um, I uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you so much to all the previous panels. This has been like a really interesting day and kind of gearing up to where we're going with our own roundtable discussion. I'm gonna kick off with a little bit of my experience, which is essentially the catalyst for this roundtable discussion. So um, as Craig mentioned, I, I went to school in the US for my BFA and I am kind of from then the before times before the, the trigger warning discourse was entering the classroom discourse. So to me, it's something that always feels a little kind of awkward and um, just it's not, it's not in my inherent and natural way of describing what I do. But that's not to say that I'm not uh, explicit about what I do, nor am I transparent about like, I'm not not transparent about my intentions. So when it was, um, I, I've had a lot of really lovely opportunities here uh, to develop my own courses around things that I've worked with, including like Hollywood and the kind of context and history of Hollywood. 
but um, also I snuck in and David Cronenberg adaptations course, which was wild to bring in a body horror context. But uh, my dream, of course, is to teach directly from my research, my PhD research on extreme cinema. And I was thinking, what are these, these boundaries and trying to uh, make it palatable to teach extreme cinema as a whole. Uh, but, you know, how do I kind of ensure that the class can function and that it can be trusted to function? And it just became such an absurd concept that I just really leaned into the absurdity of, of it all. And I pitched to the head of film studies, like, picture this. Uh, we take all the films that students are too afraid to watch, but have probably heard of, we screen them and we call it trigger warning, extreme cinema. And he was like, that's insane, let's do it. So uh, a couple of the challenges that I faced then was regarding the language of like, how do I keep, you know, kind of pitching this up the scale to get this approved in my course proposal and the course description and things like that. But the real challenge kind of kicked in when it came to preparing my syllabus because I was scheduled for the fall of 2020, which here in Iceland, while we were very lucky during the, um, during the pandemic to keep a lot of things open, that was the semester that people were really locked down and held at home. So suddenly this very invasive topic was going to actually be invading my students' homes. And here I am kind of like the hardcore, <laughs> like insensitive one, um, trying to figure out how do I make this work? Uh, I can't be there to really read the room when the room is online. So that promoted like, you know, a lot of new ways of thinking about this material and the language and the organization of it. But at the end of the day, the only trigger warning I ever used was the, the kind of catchy title, which um, admittedly was to catch attention versus just, you know, being sensitive to the content itself. So that made me want to kind of you know, explore other people's opinions about or, you know, challenges in dealing with or absorbing this idea of content warning and how to work around it when maybe essentially we are still doing what the what the goal is of content warnings. We're just kind of packaging it in different ways involved in our kind of academic analytical tools. So uh, having said that, I want to pass the mic on to um, Ashley now to explain some of her kind of experience and why she's here with us today. Yeah, thanks so much, Nikita. So I'm here because um, Nikita, you know, reached out and said like, hey, I'm interested in your work um, on, on horror and, and other things. And um, I, I have experience teaching courses on general intro to horror, um, race and economic class and relationship to horror, gender and horror. And um, I also teach a non-horror -horror course on diversity and inclusion um, in cinema and media studies, which is a required course at DePaul, one of the universities where I teach. And um, I would say that is probably one of the more uncomfortable classes that I, uh, that I teach. So in preparing for this round table, I've had a lot of really interesting uh, discussions uh, with my, my fellow co-panelists um, on some of the intersections of this, this idea of content warnings, because in my diversity and inclusion class too, we're dealing with topics related to um, uh, not only um, ethnic identity, but also uh, class, um, sexual orientation, gender identity, um, ability versus disability, and all these different um, topics, which are super personal because they're related to people's sense of identity. So I actually start that class with just a disclaimer that I'm not going to try to offend you during this course, but I probably will at some point, and you will probably offend someone else. And um, I think that is a class that I actually start, you know, like with with this disclaimer, um, just like we're all human, we're going to make mistakes. It's going to be uncomfortable because we're dealing with all the uncomfortable stuff related to identity politics. Nobody wants to talk about, but we have to in this class, and we're going to make mistakes, and that's okay. Um, and it's just been so interesting to me to think about this idea of content warnings and the fact that I use that a lot more for my non-horror courses, I feel like, than my horror courses um, themselves, because um, for my horror classes, everyone's sort of like on board to kind of be uncomfortable um, a little bit. And I, um, although I do 
provide like blanket sort of content warnings just in the syllabus and that like warning you've signed up for a horror class um the, the point is for all of us to be uncomfortable together and for me to give you different tools and things for us to work through and kind of understand um why these films are uncomfortable and un unsettling that's sort of the point of the class and then um yeah, that's so that's sort of my own background and experience with some of these things. I also come from an era where I was never given content warnings for anything um, in school and I was just fine and I feel kind of like the better for it in a way. Um, so but it's a different atmosphere now from when I, I was in college over a decade ago. So um, I'm trying to keep up with the times and be sensitive to things, but also, um, yeah, navigate these really interesting issues around around some of these topics. So hopefully that was a good overview um, and I didn't talk too long, um, but I'll, I will be quiet now. Thank you, Ashley. Valeria, how about you? All right, so I apologize in advance for my my very affected voice <laughs> because a cold got to me, but hopefully I will make it without coughing. Um, so when, when Nikita approached me because we had already kind of crossed paths uh and and approached me with this conversation regarding uh trigger and content warnings i was kind of forced back to go not in a bad way in the most productive of ways to go back into my own background because i started teaching at a ba level in mexico so of course this kind of contrast with the ways in which i'm teaching in sweden not that it's essentially different but with 10 years apart feels quite a, quite substantial of a change uh, and I mean this from my own pedagogical practice, but also in my practice as a scholar in general, as a researcher, but in general with the audiences that now we have to call them, so, to call them uh, for a lack of a better word, like the, the lack of the students that I've had for a time. <clears throat> and my path is a little bit like Ashley in this answer, not all of it has come from horror um, or from teaching horror. And I think this is such a revealing uh, a revealing thing to notice in that it sort of opens up this question whether vulnerability is mobilized not only uh, by virtue of genre but rather it can be connected to so many other conversations within philosophy within feminism and other areas that i'm uh well that i'm familiar with since i teach them and i research within them so to be more specific when i started working in mexico i was teaching aesthetic theory and aesthetic the uh, an aesthetic theory for digital digital media a lot of which seems a little bit removed from this. But of course, it was a pathway that at the time made me realize that you cannot talk about aesthetic theory without talking without politics, uh, about politics. Uh, and violence and the depiction of violence is such an integral part of these questions. Um, so of course, it, it, even though it was not focused on horror agenda, uh, ag adjacent uh, genres, it sort of laid the blueprint of this. It was not customary at the time to have content warnings, but every now and then you would have this kind of conversation and the discomfort that it would elicit often was on a case to case basis when students would feel comfortable to come forward. I always made that kind of distinction that if there was a topic that it was like, we're going to discuss uh, uh, violent imagery or we're going to be exposed to this, please feel free to leave the room. This is something that is you know, jarring to you. And I can say that it didn't happen often. And when it did happen, it was, uh, and I was very grateful for the students to feel comfortable to come forward and talk about it. Uh, nevertheless, 10 years apart or so, or less than 10 years, but this marks my 10th year in this, uh, in this kind of uh, arena of, of teaching at this level. But um, now I find myself, I was teaching a, uh, an introduction to horror, sort of a very compact module on horror as a genre uh, here in Sweden. And there was uh, less of that kind of, I don't know. I, I mean, I I did not accompany every content with a content warning. And I think that at the time I, it was also this kind of, um, this kind of subject matter that I knew was so clear from the out, uh, from the, the outset. There is a, a guideline and there is a set of contents that are devised for the course. Um, it was never, it, it never really invited any contention or any, it, any contentious um, or negative uh, feedback or, or, um, or any sort of resistance on the 
on, on the student side. Nevertheless, I'm of course moved to think about how we can channel this kind of conversations into thinking about discomfort and rage as political and as important subject matter. Uh, I am also teaching a feminist film theory course this, uh, this upcoming term and I have been involved in it before. And a part of it was to talk about horror as a way to kind of realize the ways in which these negative affects, which I mean, of course, I'm not the first person, person to say it. And a lot of this research <clears throat> that goes to tread on uh, the importance of feminism and anti-racist and anti-capitalist teaching also has to do with the productive uses of rage and discomfort. Nevertheless, the line still feels like it's moving constantly, and, and it is hard. I completely uh, uh, agree with both Nikita and Ashley that we come from we come from backgrounds, uh, educational backgrounds, that did not have this concern in mind. And I don't know how much of a lack of compassion there was, or an assumption that students are like empty vessels and let's get everything in. And I suppose we'll get to that point. Uh, and our awareness, of course, makes us a little bit more open to think about these content warnings. But I will shut up now. <laughs> it was sort of like my my way into easing about where I'm coming from as a as a teacher. Thank you so much. So I think this is a, a great point that we can continue on. So in our previous discussions that the three of us have been having together, um, I've kind of pulled out that really the kind of hot keywords like in the in the soup of our themes and topics that we keep kind of weaving in between is this um, expectations and what they are. And I kind of saw it split between like what we're kind of dancing between these pillars of the expectations of horror that in our experience, that's where like we've been safe in um, just kind of working in our with our instincts as educators, but also as um, experts and fans of that field. Um, for me, like, yes, I'm an extreme cinema now, but I always benefit from the horror identity and the horror like analysis toolbox. So that's like a safe haven in a way that there's expectations of how far it can go. But then it was also, we kept kind of moving our conversation towards like, what are the actual expectations of the classroom and how that looks? And it's a flip of, you know, what the student anticipates for us to cater to or to be considerate of or compassionate about. And we're looking at how that needs to go the other way as well. Like where is the middle that educators and um, ed students need to meet? So, um, that's kind of like we'll, where we'll be discussing today is between these, these two different pillars. But I also wanna bring attention then to our, our, the name of our, um, our roundtable discussion. Uh, if you caught it, it yes is a reference to the glorious goddess Kate Bush who had like another swirl of fandom this summer with Stranger Things. But the song that is from Hounds of Love um, album is Mother Stands for Comfort. And this was just funny because we, you know, I, I've been wondering about this position, um, the privileged position to be trusted to be the teacher of difficult content. Um, I, I wonder about the gendered uh, experience, about the representation of who is teaching it, um, how that works for and against. And this idea of like mothering came up. Um, how we are kind of maybe expected as like women to be the mothers of the classroom and the mothers to uh, a younger generation. So um, I just want to read really quick the, the chorus of Mother Stands for Comfort. Um, it's about, you know, mom is going to love her, her child no matter what they do. And it's Mother Stands for Comfort. Mother will hide the murderer. Mother hides the madman. Mother will stay mom. So uh, ladies, what do you think, just starting off on this idea of the mother archetype in the classroom? Um, if I can jump in, because I was thinking about our conversations, we've had such lovely and very productive conversations on that. Uh, and I also want to absolutely give a shout out to Nikita because <laughs> the Kate Bush element that came out from these conversations is totally her, yeah, you get the points girl. But, uh, I think that one of these productive, very productive angles of the conversation that we've had a couple of times surrounding this particular uh, round table was that we find ourselves in this very interesting position that is not only clearly very gendered in terms of the care 
that we are providing is yeah in, in our pedagogical practice but also an experience that is gendered and racialized uh and of course i i mean i am just speaking from personal uh, experience on this like the mobilizing teaching in in an environment where i where i was educated myself in a mexican university and then moving on to discuss other uh, other topics that have to do with uh race gender and class as interlocking uh, in many of these contents and as a, as a part of it that is essential to have conversations regarding horror and depiction and uh, the political uh in the like political discourses in horror and i was moved to think and i and i'm sure that you know bell hooks always comes to mind <clears throat> to think about this kind of critical dialogue that we need to have but also to me it's it's something mm, i have a hard time expressing it like putting it together in words perhaps <clears throat> but that to me keeps signaling to the fact that regardless of the content uh Teaching is an endeavor that very much may be in line with hooks. It's, it's an endeavor that is originated in care and love. But where do we find that kind of um, keeping ourselves safe as well? Uh, this assumption that the teacher is impervious to these sorts of, uh, you know, mobilized feelings, especially when, I mean, I, I can only speak from personal experience when it comes to, when it comes to talk about national trauma or violence or narco violence specifically. <clears throat> or violence against women in the Mexican context or Latin American context, these affects, of course, I need to keep at bay. Nevertheless, this kind of care, where do we find this kind of dialogue, right, uh, between the students and the teacher? And where do we keep ourselves safe in that space without, yeah, without losing ourselves to that assumption of care and love? Yeah, I can piggyback off of that. And um, I'm thinking about this idea of compassionate teaching or also sort of what maybe I call like more humanist teaching or something that hooks um advocates for um such such a big part of like what I want to give my students rather than content warnings for say like I for things that are kind of um I'd say you know like the um most like well-known like obvious like triggering things like if something is maybe including things related to uh uh issues of sexualized violence or sexual assault or something like really extreme in that nature in a class that otherwise might you know if it's if it's not a class on that subject matter when I teach my um gender female directed um horror course we do have a unit on rape revenge and that's there on the syllabus from the get-go um but I'm still open to discussing like alternative screenings and stuff with with students always but um I feel like one of the biggest gestures of like compassion or um or love uh, that you can give to a student, me personally, I think is giving them tools to like be their own best advocate, um, which is something that I, um, I'll do like a general content warning even from my horror class and be like, warning, you've signed up for a horror class. Um, but if you have, you, you know yourself best and you need to be able to advocate for yourself. I give them resources of like, um, if you feel moved, to look up whether um, any of the films that are listed, you know, on the syllabus contain certain triggers, like here are different like websites and resources you can avail yourselves of, and then come talk to me if you feel like you need an alternative screening and I will find one for you, no questions asked, you know. Um, and um, I feel like, yeah, one of the, you know, love is also, or mothering, you know, even though I'm not really interested in being a mother to my students, I am interested in being like a good, um, mentor should they want that um or someone who's just like a a guide and who has ex who's been where they've been before you know in a lot of cases and has been through that experience and was lucky enough to have mentors and stuff who extended a kind of humane compassion to to me just as like person to person rather than mother child you know professor student just like meeting one another as kind of peers and equals and recognizing one another's humanity which I think is a lot of what you know kind of hooks talks about in her statements on on teaching um as as an act of uh liberatory practice and and whatnot but I feel like one of the greatest gifts you can give your students there is like that gift of self-advocacy because that's applicable outside of the classroom and knowing yourself best and um and I also don't want to take up a position that I cannot reasonably be expected to occupy I was saying like I I'm going to know everyone's life experience and know what is going to like trigger each of you because I will fail them um and that's that's an unfair thing and an unfair reassurance 
to give someone up front, in, in my opinion, too, um, rather than kind of starting off like I do with my diversity and inclusion class with the acknowledgement of like, we're all human and that means we're not perfect. But, you know, there, there are ways to work around that. There's tools, there's dialogues we can have about things. And um, for this this idea of like linking it back to Kate Bush and how do I be the, um, the best kind of... Uh, caretaker and custodian like of my students experience in my class I feel like um not necessarily shielding them from things so that they don't experience anything that's ever upsetting I mean that doesn't even make sense in a horror classroom I feel like the point of horror sometimes is to to get upset and then kind of like process through that even though I don't want anyone to be irreparably like psychologically damaged by you know seeing something but I also don't want to put forth the idea that like a film can do that to you which I feel like Nikita and like with teaching like extreme cinema and stuff like you're in a better position to kind of talk about um some of those things and like what films that are like really really trying to go for it are like attempting to do but I also don't want to like set up this expectation for my students either that they need to be afraid of certain forms of media or that they can't handle something but if they feel like they'd rather not for whatever reason to just be able to advocate for themselves and then we can talk about it and come up with like alternative screenings um and and things of that nature so I yeah that's that's kind of my stance on that is like I'm all about equipping students for tools they can use in the classroom but just in their lives as well so definitely some uh great points and insight coming out like right out the gate but um just this idea of like um uh Stella had mentioned it earlier um, and I kind of felt like there's a lot of sensitivity trying to cater like, yes, how do we redirect? How do we rewrite like our, you know, habits of speaking about something that we are so comfortable with because it is our interest, but it's also like our strength. Uh, and she did mention herself, but like, we don't know what's going to trigger. And it's very surprising. And it was interesting in the extreme cinema course when I started asking, like, just for fun as an extra credit assignment, like, go ahead, rank the films, which one was the most disturbing to you? And as expected, there was a lot of um, a Serbian film at the top. And that was also like my least successful address of um, dealing with extreme cinema. But that comes you know, back to this issue that we're talking about of where is the middle that we meet. Uh, the reason a Serbian film I think did not do well was that my students like called out on homework that week. They didn't want to engage uh, for whatever reason. It could have been burnout. It could have been just the notoriety of the film. But uh, I think it also wasn't like maybe cool enough for them because they all showed up for Irreversible, but they slept on a Serbian film and let that, you know, the insight that we had kind of roll over them. Um, but it's, it still came out that like the more extreme things were thing were more like solo or martyrs. And as I anticipated, people were also saying like fat girl was actually for them a much more extreme experience. And it wasn't even like a personal, uh, explanation why, but it was just, it's so relentless in that confrontation of something that's so ubiquitous and so just widespread and everywhere and touches everything and to really just focus in on how uh, destructive and painful it is, is um, powerful. Um, but going back then to maybe the idea of, you know, getting uncomfortable and dealing with uh, the politics because the classroom is inherently political. And that's something that we were definitely like kept coming up in our discussion and could be just summarized by that statement, the classroom is political. Um, what are some experiences then like kind of diving deeper into that and maybe getting into the question of the makeup of our student body and the multiculturalism or lack thereof? Can I just jump in? <laughs> because otherwise, sometimes it's just like I just lose the thread of myself. Um, I think that it also brings me back to some of these conversations that we've had the different environments in which we teach prove to us again and again that there is such a diverse pool of students that we have uh the beginning perhaps in in my own experience teaching 
in my country of origin, teaching for the most part Mexican students uh, and counting on that kind of cultural framework to, to draw from and therefore maybe having a very different take on what is going to prompt or what could be a vulnerable or like a, a topic that exposes certain vulnerabilities off the bat. Um, but it is engaging in such a different and very rich and productive way with a multicultural classroom in Sweden. Most of this, my students are Swedish. Nevertheless, the course is taught in English and I often have students with different backgrounds. And I think this makeup of, of, the, of the courses themselves lends itself to such a rich discussion. I will, in reviewing other stuff and reviewing uh, literature for this panel, um, <clears throat> I was thinking through these ideas of how do we learn and learn ourselves and also pass that scale on to the students to learn with conflict and how do we cope with it. Uh, I was reading this article, it was unrelated to this, it had to do with teaching uh, gaming and, and so on for my, for one of their dossiers on, on feminist pedagogy. Um, and <clears throat> the authors were just both um, Oh, I forget their first names. I'm sorry, uh, but I will post the I will post a reference. And the authors made uh, the the uh, article is called "Leveling Up," and the authors make this contention about when we're teaching uh, our students that it is fundamental and important to cope with conflict. Uh, the difference is going to arise at some point, and that it doesn't have to be you know maybe paid over. We open ourselves for that radical openness, and I'm just quoting them, and they're also elaborating on on hooks. Um, and to it, it, it being a dialogue, it, it is unexpected. I think it puts you it puts you in a position to think on your feet. I can recall a very recent uh, a very recent um, experience that I had that wasn't necessarily about horror. And this is my hence my insistence that either oppression or vulnerability knows no genre. It is not something that is inherent to the genre, perhaps, but it is something that is difficult to predict. I was teaching continuity. Which can be, I mean, of course, it is so loaded with the idea, it, it is an, a loaded practice and it is loaded with ideology, but I was teaching, you know, the, the kind of points and facts types of, uh, types of frames, etc. And, and takes and so on. And I was using uh, Seven Chances by Buster Keaton, you know, thinking about the effect of like the overall way of, um, of conveying humor through, uh, through editing practice. And one of these notions sort of like, I, I didn't quite think about it um, in terms of a content warning, right? So we have the practice of blackface in that film. And I was thinking like, this is going to be a point of contention, but I really also need to see how this works in those senses, because there are outdated racist um, depictions. <coughs> um, and the students, I, I was very, I don't know, I was very pleased with the way that this dialogue spun out, because the students themselves took the conversation that was extremely difficult to have to think about how does humor normalizes these courses and i felt like in enabling that of course it is a little bit of a game of chance we we do we're not i don't think that anyone is really set up to offend anyone um you know intentionally and and with ill spirit um uh, but it was such a rich conversation and i keep thinking that that was such a it was a very revealing experience because these were students in their first semester uh, students that are making this very important transition between um, well, high school education and their yeah their passage to higher education. So in this kind of sense, uh, I'm, I was also moved to think about the hierarchy that like this kind of implicit hierarchy in the, of the content warning. Where is it that we are? We it, it's difficult to map. Uh, like just pointing out um, or drawing from this comment regarding the. Um, uh, what is going to trigger something or someone or reaction that is unpleasant. But in dealing in this risky business of negative affect and bad feelings as productive uh, ways of, of challenging unjust, um, unjust power hierarchies, I'm just moved to think that very often, or at least it has been my experience to be afraid of what the students are going to maybe react to. But in this case, it was such an open, honest and this yeah it was it was an uncomfortable conversation but it didn't make it less productive so i think that there is a way around that sort of give and take between the teacher and the students even though well we have to admit we don't have all the answers but we can get them through this practice maybe or something closer to an answer that's beautiful there's a lot of beauty in getting raw and digging into the the mushy center of our emotions ashley do you have any follow-up 
Yeah, so I was thinking um, while Valerie was talking also about like the difference to, I mean, this isn't always always necessarily apply, but in my various teaching experiences, School of the Art Institute is more of an art conservatory. Um, I do teach some horror courses there. Um, the other place where I teach DePaul, um, I have not taught horror there yet. I did teach an authorship course on David Fincher, some overlap with aspects of horror and some of in some of his work. Um, but uh, DePaul is where I teach this diversity and inclusion class. And it's the, I was thinking about the, the role too of like electives versus like required courses too. And I think something that is so, I don't feel like I've gotten a lot of pushback in, in any of my courses really at, at DePaul. In fact, the few times I've had students bothered by content um, and kind of saying something about it um, is in my intro to film course that I teach at SAIC, which is um, is in a, an elective. It's like, it's not an elective, it's one of those kind of like core courses. You could take that or you could take something else from this, you know, choice of three different classes or so. But I had pushback of a student who um, was really upset that I didn't give um, a trigger warning um, for the film, uh, Damien Chazelle's, Chazelle's film Whiplash, um, because there were homophobic slurs in it. And it's like, well, my, that's not what the film's about. And we were watching it for the purposes of editing as well. And there is a blanket trigger warning on that um, class sheet as there is on all of my class sheets, but it's even more detailed for my non-horror courses, I feel like. It's like we're watching films that include adult content and um, and everything ranging from, you know, like violence to gore to um, to bullying to, you know, and I would have considered like the the slurs in that film under the rhetoric of uh, of bullying you know and these are I get the same resources in every class this is where you can look into for um uh particular triggers that you might have and like talk to me you know about that um but um yeah that's that's like one of the most um like prominent um examples I have in in my memory whereas um kind of similar to some of the um concerns of Valeria had in showing um uh, Buster Keaton's uh, Seven Chances um we're we're dealing with a lot of aspects of like um tokenized representation in my diversity and inclusion class because we're kind of looking at the history of how representation has occurred over time and various stereotypes we might want to um avoid moving forward because a lot of the students in that class are um it's a required course for everyone which makes it makes it a little rough because not everybody wants to be there and i think the nature of um taking up the idea of diversity and inclusion is something that we want to accomplish in media um, in the US has become a very kind of politicized idea of like this liberal agenda. And I will sometimes have students in that course who are um, more conservative in their political leanings who are um, offended and frustrated that they're forced to sit through 10 weeks of this. And um, I try and make space for that too. I tell you know my students who, you know, we're at liberal arts college in Chicago. Most of my students want to, Think of themselves as woke and inclusive and I was like if you want to think of yourself as inclusive you have the burden of including like ideas and viewpoints that don't align with your own someone who wants to be um a self-professed you know like um like not interested in that and and anti-inclusive um they they don't have that same burden and um I feel like a lot of students since I've started that class with disclaimers now and stuff um a lot of students are on board for the fact that things are gonna be uncomfortable and not everyone's gonna think the same thing. And I'm very grateful I've had students who do come from more conservative backgrounds still still willing to share and stuff in that class. But I do think that that divide between like where content warnings work in the classroom and the way they can have applicability, um, I feel like I get more pushback outside of my horror classrooms about, about those things and the ways in which I've addressed them or failed to meet them. And, um, and I think also whether students are being compelled to be there versus choosing to be there because they're engaged with the topic is, is an important factor as well. Great, thank you. Um, I was just thinking like, um, this is now kind of bubbling up in my head and I don't think I've ever worded it this way in our past discussions, but um, I was probably mentioning once about uh, my last class of the trigger warning class and it, it sounds so strange to call it a trigger warning class in the context of the discussion and discourse of trigger warnings since I didn't use them. I never used them. They're always just uh, 
it was the content was always absorbed into our lectures and used as opportunities to provide context. But uh, I did bring up the discussion of trigger warnings at the very last class. And I asked the students, like, is this something you subscribe to? Is this something you believe in? Is this something you want to see more of? And they're very, you know, righteous in the sense of like, yeah, that is the stuff. That's what we want to do. And it's what we want to see. And I said, but did you feel that this course uh, was enough of a trigger warning for you? And they said, oh, absolutely. Like, I don't know if they're just afraid of me, but <laughs> they said so. And I was like, but I never gave you one. I, I didn't, I didn't play by those rules. I was, I never kept any secrets from you. I never in, uh, intended to surprise you. Uh, I always try to empower them by saying you're students, you're first, audience second. It's not the director's access now to shock you. You are studying them. And so I said, you know, I never, I never provided you with a trigger warning by those rules. And they're like, yes, but it's extreme cinema. You know what you're getting into. And I said, no, you don't. You literally don't. And that was our running joke was every single week when we were changing our topic and changing the film, it was like, okay, so next week it's this film. It's not what you think it's going to be. It's different from what you expect. And this, it literally was our running joke. Like when's Nikita gonna say, it's not what you expect. So uh, I, I brought that up. I'm like, but I told you every week, it's not what you expect. And they just kind of didn't have words to kind of find their way out of this little soup <laughs> that, they, that they were boiling in. So I'm wondering, what do you think about um, within your horror, horror classrooms versus these other classrooms that you're having these experiences and dealing with kind of raw feelings? Um, is there any kind of false sense of security that is being established by relying on certain um, practices or methodologies or, you know, classroom mom? Hmm. I think there was a yeah that that was a that was a big a big one <laughs> question um, because I think this what prompts me when when you talk about your experience and thank you for sharing like how you know how quizzical of an experience it was because I mean asking something off the bat like that to students also I think gives us a very interesting kind of blueprint of where we're at in our common understandings of, of trigger warnings or content warnings, what they mean for some and what they mean for others. Um, and I am also going to draw from what from what Ashley was uh, sharing, that we cannot ignore that we have a very diverse classroom. And therefore, there might be some more politically conservative leanings, which uh, are, it's not that we are discouraging dissent, I think, or it shouldn't be at least from from where I stand, it shouldn't be. Uh, nevertheless, I'm I'm sort of like, I hope I'm not straying away from from the original uh, question or the original topic. But I was thinking about the mobilization of the idea of the notion of content warning or trigger warning that we also see, or at least as my perception is, that we also see mobilized to invalidate what the function is supposed to be, meaning uh, the mobilization of of the of the notion of content warning or trigger warning to undermine very often anti-patriarchal, anti-racist, anti-capitalist struggle as political subject matter that we discuss. Uh, if this, you know, like as a, a, as in thinking critically about horror, about film at all, uh, and how these languages of vulnerability often, and and I'm here, I'm 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 drawing a little bit more on. Um, uh, this this really interesting piece that I was revising for this panel <laughs> by um, Katarina Kirola, who is a Finnish scholar, a feminist scholar, that is talking about this in terms of the um, of a, uh, of online spaces. But I think it's really applicable here. Where can we also be in in this position that stays worry about what we first that we have a common at least understanding operating understanding of content warning and trigger warning in the classroom if we are to use them in these contexts. But also to, it, I find it a little bit disquieting that now with the, with this kind of recent rise of um, of very conservative right wing or white supremacist discourse in the political sphere, these have been mobilized in other extents that we cannot maybe foresee, but that we might 
be wise the wiser to actually think about because these are these are affects that are also mobilized in our classrooms right i'm not claiming that i have a, an answer and that okay well just like tell, throw them in the bin but but rather that it invites us to think about this conversation as way more complex it, it is no longer necessarily about that which is uh triggered or yeah mobilized in affect uh, as, a, as an experience that you know is going to cause or recall some trauma or 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 um uh, or negative affect in our students, but I think that this kind of other mobilization is also something that we should, that we'd, we'd be wise to, to stay worry about. I don't know if it makes sense. Ashley, do you have anything to add to that before maybe we also start kind of absorbing some questions in the chat? I think since we're low on time I say I say we can move into questions and maybe you know anything I I can work in anything I have to say into a bring it on back whenever you can so <laughs> if anyone has a question you can also um raise your hand and I'll rely on the ladies to help well uh We'll just keep talking until someone interrupts us. <laughs> it, looks like Kate, it looks like Kate has a question. Um, Kate, if you want to come on and ask yours. Yay. Hi, um, that, that was just absolutely fascinating. And um, um, I absolutely love the fact as well that the panel is named after my favorite Kate Bush song. Um, and, I, and I wanted to ask something in relation to that, actually, because I found that idea the mother idea really fascinating and also what Ashley was saying about the importance of a kind of compassionate humanist teaching and about care um it's, it's just stuff that I'm, I'm really committed and interested in but I was just wondering how do we you know this panel is is a panel of female educators and I was just wondering how how do we kind of balance that with this problem that that's often debated sort of within higher education about the burden of responsibility for student care often being put perhaps disproportionately on female teachers. I just wondered what, what you all thought about that, you know, kind of getting that balance so that it doesn't become the case that it, it almost becomes an expectation that it's female lecturers who take on that responsibility more than perhaps male lecturers. I've wondered a lot about this myself because when I'm comparing to my male colleagues, we're not having the same experience. Um, also as like a personal, you know, like the the one on one kind of experiences with students. And I think it's interesting, too, because um, because I'm teaching these uh, film you know, courses that are extreme cinema or some kind of relevant saw tourism and stuff. I have a very male dominated class. And this was something that the ladies and I were kind of comparing earlier, like what, you know, what is the gender makeup of your courses too? Like who's coming? And I have a very kind of like cis heterosexual male, like majority. Um, but I think a lot of this is like, I think we're just in such a flux right now that I'm not sure because I think COVID really threw in uh, a new set of challenges where it did make it so incredibly personal because we're literally all of us in our homes doing it as well. So it kind of becomes inherent to the experience. It becomes personal. So I'm really curious about like what people are seeing in their institutions. I'm seeing a lot of instability right now, just based on money. Um, you know, so that's kind of having a, a dominant say of like what we can and can't do versus the kind of more political or social sensitivities. What about you, Valeria and Ashley? Um, yeah, I mean, I I was uh, I always go back to our backstage conversations <laughs> before this, mm -hmm. and I think what what Kate and what Nikita are raising is so important because first I have to say I I at the beginning I didn't quite register it as an expectation of my role as a you know like as a female lecturer. Um, to an extent, I thought like, well, this is this kind of comfort that comes with feeling comfortable enough. Well, that was reiterative, but this kind of assurance that that you are giving to a student, so it may be coming from this place of, oh, you know, you look approachable. But the more time goes by, I realize that it is it it, it seems to be this kind of unspoken expectation. I don't know where the, whether a balance can be achieved, but I think that 
uh, in the in you know recalling this conversation that we um, that we had before, um, this kind of need to establish a certain limit or establish to draw limits in in a way that is also compassionate to us might at least start these this sort of um, I mean, if not at an institutional level in, in the level of the classroom and hopefully, you know, prompting this outside of it, you know, so it's not automatically assumed like compassionate teaching has to be both ways. Right. Or at least from where I stand. So uh, drawing these limits without the with, uh, within the compassion that we owe to ourselves, regardless of the subject matter we're teaching. I'm not saying that it's easy. I'm not saying that I know exactly how to. But what I do know is that it might be a signal to how to also understand that the teacher is not necessarily also, you know, having all the all the answers. The educator is not necessarily impervious to to any of these affects. So I hope that kind of treaded in my in the suggestion. Yeah, and just quickly, um, to like what I'm seeing, what I feel like I'm seeing more and more in the institutions where I teach too is other than like this expectation of you being like a mother to your students there's more of this expectation of I feel like so many of the universities have moved towards this consumer model and instead like students are consumers and it's your job to give them a product and a grade they're happy with which I have some pushback um you know myself with um where it's like well no they're not buying a grade you know in the class there you know they're buying a seat in the class um but um I feel like that's kind of what I'm seeing more so but there can be some overlap with that because then there's still that expectation that you're there to please them or provide entertaining content or whatever and not there to actually like teach or challenge um in some ways which i i also find you know a, a difficult thing to negotiate but i know we've got other questions so i'll stop there i'm just gonna add on too because i saw so much of the earlier presentations talking about this like what is inherently interesting to us and is our inherent strengths as uh you know academics in horror um that there is that's like again there's like a safety in that expectation and I think um there's there's something that maybe I kind of exploit to my advantage being a woman representing you know this kind of category of skill sets and tolerance um for and I if that is something like an identity that uh encourages students to trust me so I can push them into critical thinking, then I am going to exploit that identity. Then I will be mommy. Like if that's what it takes to get critical thinking off the ground, uh, because it's just, I find it really scary how that is lacking. Um, and it's lacking way further back in their earlier pedagogies. Um, and it's hard to catch up as an adult. So uh, as much as I don't want to be mother and hide the madman, like, I'm also, you know, going to try to bring out the best out of them anyhow. Um, and it is exhausting and I'm I'm often very tired, I guess. So, but I think for people that feel like they're kind of they're in danger because of their interest and that it is so natural to them to be into this that when they're kind of, you know, trying to bring students into it, they feel like, you know, ah, this is, you know, a clash in uh me as the educator and me as like a a um a mentor and a leader um I think it also has its benefits in a way so I hope that helped <laughs> hello you, I'm just popping up I'm just popping up to say that we've got permission to go to about five past if you want to take a few oh minutes. wonderful thank you so much okay let me That's see what else is going on here is there any other questions if someone wants to jump in you've got uh Lindsay Hallam's got a hand up oh come in hi Lindsay hi Hi, um, this has been an amazing panel. I've just been nodding and relating to kind of everything that you've been talking about. Um, and yeah, I mean, yeah, the, a lot of a lot of the pastoral care that we just we as academics in general have really had to take up, especially in the past couple of years, has been quite overwhelming because I am not qualified um, to deal with that. But that also, when you're teaching these things, like um, I mentioned uh, at the, the the top where I. Um, presenting first today. Um, I teach at an institution that has a very, very diverse um, student population. And um, one of the things that I've found that's been um, the most difficult to navigate was actually not my horror module, but my film history module. 
Um, and uh, and uh, I related a lot to um, Valeria's um, story about talking to the students about the Bosque Keaton because I ended up having a really, um, uh, it was a really great productive um, conversation with students about when we inevitably had to come to a birth of a nation. Oh, um, yeah, um, which you could say is the most, <laughs> talk, talking horror, you know, you can't get past that really. Um, but, um, but yeah, I find that, um, I mean, one of the things I also came across in my film history um, module was uh, there was a problem when we had, a, uh, we watched Singing in the Rain because instead of the overt racism that you get in Birth of a Nation, in the background in one shot of Singing in the Rain, they're on a studio lot and you see just these characters, these like um, people coming from a film set and they're in blackface with these kind of jungle costumes. Yeah, it's really, it's really quite offensive, but it's just totally in the background and it's totally just very casual. And um, that actually got more of a reaction from a lot of the students. Um, but I guess my question is, is like, how are you dealing with when you're coming to kind of older texts and outdated texts, like from thinking, for example, like in terms of horror, like when you, we, you look at like zombie narratives, like what, white zombie from the 1930s, just, I mean, how you've navigated with older texts and those outdated attitudes, because students sometimes want films from almost a hundred years ago to conform to what we think of as kind of uh, appropriate mm -hmm. attitudes. That's a great question. I think the oldest text that I kind of was using in the trigger warning class, and it was more as a reference, was, um, oh my God, Peeping Tom. <laughs> but ladies, what is the oldest text that you are working with? I don't remember. I think Buster Keaton might have been the the oldest that sort of signaled those attitudes. But when, when Lindsay was bringing this up, I remember I did have White Zombie last term. Um, and it resulted in such an interesting uh, essay by one of my students. Uh, and I think that precisely, even if, if we are not to, you know, like horseshoe everything into this, this awareness that is constantly expanding, uh, that of course was not translating on the screen uh, at that time, because at that time, but <laughs> I was thinking about this, it, it really, it really sort of dislodges memory because it, it was it was particularly during that course that we had white zombie and we're thinking about the 30s and colonialism and exploitation and plant, uh, plantations and so forth. And they had towards the end, uh, Isa Lopez's are, uh, Tigers Are Not Afraid. And it was the students themselves that knowing in themselves in a position of hierarchy and that was so enriching and enlightening because rather than making me afraid, made me aware that they are aware of these conversations and where the limits to these conversations can be. Um, because regarding um, Isa Lopez, even though it's not an old text, it's a very new text, I had all these questions of like, I don't feel, coming from the students, I don't feel like I can discuss this because it's not my cultural context. Can we provide a little bit more? And when you see this sort of, I, I think that that sort of shows that we are getting ahead in this conversation. I mean, it is disorienting sometimes <clears throat> and a little bit yeah, I guess difficult to navigate. But when I see that these processes are being prompted, even regarding, you know, newer texts, then I feel like that's that's where it is. <laughs> yeah, as far as my earliest films that I that I actively teach, I think, um, you know, I do Alfred Hitchcock's Notorious in my intro to film class, but I, I mean, there's like a Nazi conspiracy in there, I guess, but um, uh, not a lot of other like politicized like aspects necessarily. But I do do The Bride of Frankenstein, which has a lot of, you know, like, I can't even call it queer coding. <laughs> I feel like it is just at the level of text, but I feel like students are very on board for looking at the very like, I like explicitly like counter hegemonic argument that Wales film is like trying to engage in there and stuff. So, um, and I teach singing in the rain as well, but I've not had that same, um, same experience uh, with it, but it is something that will be on my radar now, should it come up. Hello folks. I think we're going to have to call it a day there just to make sure that everybody gets a break. Is there anything you wanted to add just before I kind of round things up? No? Okay, thank you. That was an absolutely fascinating discussion. There's so much to think about there. So thank you to Ashley, to Nikita, and to Valeria. I really, really enjoyed that.